Okay, well, thank you very much for that really generous introduction. Uh, I really apologize that we've started late, but I hope people won't mind if we take the whole hour. Uh, Larry is a fascinating person, so that's going to be my plan. Uh, and what I was thinking is I would ask Larry questions for about 40 minutes and then have about 20 minutes of questions from everybody else. Uh, as I was getting ready to ask Larry some questions, I called up Mark Carney and said, what do you talk to Larry about? And he said, well, you know, I don't really talk to Larry about things. I just listen to Larry because he's so smart that I don't want to hear myself talk. I just want to hear what he has to say. Um, so Larry really is um, fiercely intelligent. Um, I just before I ask him questions, I want to share one different side of Larry because we are in a university. Uh, and I first met him, I called him Professor Summers in those days, uh, when I was 19 years old and I was a student at Harvard. Uh, you may have heard that Harvard professors are very distant and have nothing to do with ignorant undergraduates particularly very brilliant ones like Professor Summers, but I went in to talk to him about the economic reform program of the Lithuanian Soviet Socialist Republic, which Professor Summers was then advising. Uh, and he has been uh, my advisor and my mentor ever since, and I know so all the professors here, I hope you are listening to this. Um, he has been a tremendous mentor to me and to a number of his students, my friends, um, really for decades. So uh, that to me is a testament of the power of universities and of the relationships you build there and of great caring professors. So thank you very much. Uh, on to the questions. I thought... Thank you, Christia. Um, <laughs> I could get used to this. Maybe I should just listen for the next, uh, uh, for the next hour. Um, all the students are at uh, Harvard are quite special. Um, Few of them are quite like you uh, were. You were 19, and if you'll pardon me, you probably could have passed for 16 <laughs> at uh, that moment until you started to talk about economic developments in Ukraine, um, which you talked about with extraordinarily, extraordinary thoughtfulness and uh, wisdom that went uh, way beyond, way beyond uh, your years. But uh, you are absolutely right in highlighting how important what happens in universities uh, is. Uh, I think if you look at uh, the strength of the United States, the strength of North America, no small part of it has to do with what happens at uh, places uh, like uh, this. And in a world that's more competitive and more challenging than ever before, the culture of institutions like this one makes an extraordinary difference. I had an experience a few years ago at Harvard. I taught a freshman seminar and Freshman seminar was about global financial issues. It was about global economic issues. And at one of the sessions, it was about global financial issues. And for the only time in the semester, I had assigned the students the major lecture of the American Economic Association, which I had given when I was Treasury Secretary. And the students were supposed to have read that lecture. And each class began with the students commenting on the reading. This was perhaps about this time of year. And one freshman in my seminar began his comment something like this. And then there was President Summers' uh, lecture. It was kind of interesting, but the data didn't come close to proving the conclusion. And I thought to myself, what if, I mean, the data did prove the conclusion, at least in my <laughs> view. Let me be perfectly clear. But I thought to myself, what a fantastic thing and in how many other human institutions could somebody who is 19 years old feel free to say to the guy who had the title president, who was talking about what he'd done when he was minister of finance of his country, that he didn't really know what he was talking about? <laughs> and what a fantastic way of making sure you made more progress that was. And in a world where so much is 
governed by prerogative and tradition, that universities are places where that kind of thing can happen, makes them absolutely essential as uh, engines of progress. And so I salute what happens uh, here at Western Ontario, and I salute those like the Beattie family who support what happens uh, here at Western Ontario. But if we don't start arguing about the economy, this is gonna get it's boring. boring. Okay, so go so, ahead with your questions. Okay, so let's start with Europe, uh, which seems to be ground zero right now in the world economy. Is the Euro gonna survive, and, and should we want it to? I, I think we should want, I think we should want the European Union to project to survive, and we should want Europe uh, to, uh, we sh we, and we should therefore want uh, the Euro uh, to survive. You know, this is about much more uh, than banks. The history of Europe for as long as it's been recorded has basically been a history of wars between people in one region of it and another region of it for a thousand years. And that has come to seem almost inconceivable in most of the continent. And the reason is that there's been a very different kind of approach uh, to coming together after the worst of the wars, the Second World War, than there ever was before. And anyone who believes in friendship between nations, who believes in economic integration as a way of bringing peoples uh, together, has to believe that the European Union is a profoundly good thing and want it to succeed. Unfortunately, and really unfortunately, um, there is a tendency in, a tendency on the part of political leaders to believe that in economic things, political will can overcome technical flaw in a way that one wouldn't in other spheres. Only a fool would suppose that you could build a nuclear reactor in a way that nuclear, nuclear engineers thought was dangerous. But if you just had enough political will to keep the nuclear reactor safe, it would be okay. Few would build a suspension bridge with too few girders simply because it would be easier that way and there was really a strong political will on both sides for the bridge to stay up. And yet the monetary union had important internal contradictions within it. One important internal contradiction involved uh, the degree of difference between the different uh, European economies. Perhaps the most profound one is suggested by this example. Suppose that everyone in this room were to go to dinner tonight and it was agreed that we would all pay one 350th of the cost. I imagine that people would order quite lavishly. If we were gonna do that every day, anyone who didn't figure out the first day that they were supposed to order quite lavishly would have figured it out by the end of the week. If we then said, actually it's a little better than that, not only are we each gonna to go to dinner, but we're each gonna pay one 350th of the party and we can each invite as many friends as we want, the thing would get kinda of out of control. Well, that in a way is what happened when you had a single printer of money and you had many different budgeters acting without uh, control. So, and particularly, it is what happened when there was one central bank and banks that were separately regulated in each of a number of countries. The incentive to over lever, to draw on the common pool was excessive. What's the natural control? The natural control is that the more responsible um, and uh, more powerful entities control the less powerful ones 
But European history with um, German control has not been happy in the 20th century. And so there was resistance, and legitimate and understandable resistance to that. So in some ways, what is surprising is not that the euro is having a crisis. What is surprising is that it took as long for the euro to have a crisis as it has, given the technical difficulty in what was an enormously attractive uh, vision. We are not going to get out of this by supposing that if we're just patient, things will calm down. That is not the way bank runs and financial crises work. We are not going to get out of these by following, as I believe Europe has to an excessive extent to date, what might be called the Vietnam uh, model of decision making. You know, if you go back and you study the historiography of Vietnam, what you find is that every three months, policymakers were confronted with a choice. Option A, you can take no action and the system will, and the whole thing will collapse. South Vietnam will collapse. Option B, you can do A, B, and C, which are painful in a variety of respects and very politically complex for you. And they will afford you not a certainty, but a chance of resolving the situation in a decisive way. Option C, you can do A and part of B, and you'll avoid a collapse for the next couple months, but there's no one who's got expertise who will tell you you have a real chance of resolution. And the history of Vietnam is that for six or seven years, policymakers did Policymakers did uh, A and part of B. They did the last option, and then eventually their policy collapsed around them. That's what's happened in Europe for the last two years. At every moment, they have done what might have been sufficient if it had been done six months before, but that by the time they did it was insufficient. Most recently in the October 26th agreement before the Khan summit. There is no alternative right now to clear recognition of the inability to pay in the countries that will be unable to service their debts, realistic assessment of the need for bank capital and provision of bank capital on a large scale in the institutions that hold substantial amounts of risky sovereign debt and very substantial liquidity support to countries who cannot borrow from the market at a rate at which they will be able to sustainably manage uh, their debts. There's not an alternative uh, to that and a clear set of convincing policies in those three dimensions has not yet uh, been put in place. And with every 50 basis point increase in yields in the risky countries, the amount that needs to be done only rises. Okay, the amount that needs to be done only rises. Your plan is a comprehensive and expensive one. Who should pay? You know, it's much less important who pays than it is that somebody uh, pays. Bonds don't know who buys them, and it doesn't really matter whether the liquidity is created by the ECB, whether the liquidity is created by the ECB lending money to the IMF, whether the liquidity is created by an expanded EFSF, um, the governments of Europe uh, working together. What's important is that it be created, that its presence be signaled strongly and decisively. Here's a sort of an observation about how financial markets work. Probably the most successful thing that's been done by financial authorities in the last several months is uh, what was done by the Swiss Central Bank. 
The Swiss had a problem, which was that their currency kept going up because everybody was fleeing out of the euro. Now, admittedly, it's easier to solve the problem of too much money coming into your country than it is to solve the problem of too much money leaving your country, admittedly. But the Swiss responded by saying, okay, 120 um, euro to the Swiss franc, we're there. You bring us 1.2 euro, we will give you a Swiss franc. We print Swiss franc, we can do it forever. The Swiss franc immediately depreciated to just about 120. And the Swiss have printed almost no Swiss franc because everybody knew, so nobody really tested it. The Japanese, in contrast, had a quite similar problem. The yen rose quite substantially. They were concerned for some of the same reasons that the Swiss were concerned. Their exporters found that their exports, when they tried to sell them, were very expensive. And the Japanese said, we're going to spend $50 billion worth of yen, and we're going to teach those guys a lesson, and we're going to buy. They spent $50 billion and they moved the price for four days. The difference is when you do things with certainty and clear and total commitment, they are much more effective than if you do them tentatively and uh, incrementally. And that is the problem the Europeans are having. Now, I don't want to leave the impression that it's easy or that what I'm saying is obvious. Why do they have the problem? And some of you, I guess, I've told are students of uh, media, and uh, I know Reuters, um, where uh, you work and where Jeff uh, helps uh, to lead, has a, uh, is one of the central media outlets of our time. Here's the problem. What do you want to do if you're the authorities in a situation vis-a-vis -vis one of the Mediterranean countries right now? From the perspective of the signal you want to send to the government, basically the signal you want to send is you've got to control your spending and taxing. It's got to be a crash diet. If you don't do the crash diet, there's not going to be any intervention and you're going to just have complete and utter economic calamity. And you must do it, and there is no alternative. That's the message you wish to send to the country. What is the message you wish to send to the markets? Oh, well, you know, we really got to motivate the country. We're just kind of scaring them. This is going to be OK in the end. You can leave your money in. Well, here's the problem. In a free society, you actually kind of have to send the same message to the country that you do to the markets. Economists talk a lot about problems of information asymmetry, but this is a problem of information symmetry. You have to send essentially the same message in both directions, and if you do send this, and if you do send uh, the same uh, message in uh, both uh, in both. Uh, directions, you know, what do you do? You sort of titrate the message a bit back and forth, and nobody looks too graceful on a balance beam. And that's why the authorities look a little uncertain and tentative and vacillating, because when it goes one way, and they've got the country scared, but they've got the markets panicked, they reassure the markets. And when the country's feeling like it's OK, because the authorities are going to guarantee everything, then they lurch the other way. So it's understandable that this is happening, but it is a very, very difficult place uh, to uh, to be. Uh, I think this is going to be with us for uh, some time. And the last thing I'll say about this is it would be a mistake to think that we are all spectators and that this is a European problem. Europe has huge banks. The banks in Europe relative to the size of the economies are much larger than the banks in the United States relative to the size of the American economy or the banks in Canada relative to the size of the Canadian economies. They are major purveyors of capital around the world. 
They finance huge amounts of trade. They finance large amounts of, um, they grease large amounts of business transactions uh, throughout the world. And so a European retrenchment is a global retrenchment. And uh, so I think the situation is uh, a very, very serious one right now. What about something worse than retrenchment? What about an unplanned collapse of the euro? Well, it depends what one means. In some sense, an unplanned collapse of the euro can always be avoided by the creation, by the printing of, uh, of uh, euros. But so the ECB doesn't seem very a great keen deal, to do that. A great deal will ride on uh, the on what the ECB does, and in fairness to the ECB's um, predicament, um, they have a their situation, and this is a helpful analogy I find in thinking about financial crisis. How should the government of Canada approach the issue of ransom policy when its citizens are kidnapped? I would suggest to you that a policy of absolute and total refusal to ever pay ransom under any conceivable circumstances is not a realistic policy, not a policy that any government will in fact actually follow. But I would also suggest to you that a policy of uh, clarifying the conditions and explaining the circumstances under which you would pay ransom is ill-advised. <laughs> and so a certain amount of denial until necessity intrudes is probably the essence of managing that situation. And there's an analogy with uh, the ECB. Or uh, to take a... Um, less uh, freighted and weighted uh, example that I dare say goes on uh, here at Western Ontario. What is the right policy for a professor with respect to, ma uh, with respect to discussing makeup exams on the first day of class? <laughs> Most of us as professors don't quite want to say no makeup exam under any circum under any circumstance under any circumstances. You know, you're uh, you're uh, you're you're kidnapped and your parents are both having heart transplants, but you have to take your exam. That's probably not a realistic position. On the other hand, if you go and you say, well, look, you know, we understand stuff happens, and when stuff happens, there's going to be makeup exams. You're going to be writing a lot of makeup <laughs> exams, and people aren't going to be studying for the final. So what you sort of do is you don't quite say things that aren't going to be true, but you try to leave a scary impression, and then you're pragmatic when the time comes. <laughs> That's probably a way to think about the ECB. Okay, I guess you better hope your students aren't going to watch the video of you admitting your true policy on makeup exams. That is a risk that I am going to have to take. Um, so <coughs> watching Europe and watching this sort of Vietnam syndrome of always being six months too late, does it make you feel you did a pretty good job in 2009? I don't, I don't see how anybody can be satisfied when unemployment in the United States is 9%. And I don't think anybody can be satisfied with uh, the situation of uh, economic performance in the United States. President Obama certainly isn't, sat certainly isn't satisfied. And I don't think any of us who advised him are, uh, sat are satisfied with where we are. I do think that in looking at what happened, it's important to recognize that in the six months after the fall of 2008, stock prices fell much faster, credit spreads widened much more, employment fell much more rapidly, and world trade spiraled downwards more quickly than in the six months after the fall of 1929. And as serious and adverse as the current situation is, we're talking about unemployment in the United States 4% above normal. 
we were talking after the uh, after 1929 about unemployment 20 percent um, uh, above uh, normal. So I think we were successful in what was the fundamental and initial objective, which was to staunch uh, the hemorrhaging. I think there has been a continuing problem of too little demand for the economy to fully achieve uh, escape velocity. And that goes in part to the fact that our plan wasn't for Europe to be an implosive force uh, in uh, the global economy. It goes in part to the fact that there wasn't the political capacity to enact as much fiscal stimulus as probably would have been desirable uh, in uh, the economy. And it goes to the basic fact that history is that these kinds of cyclical downturns, what you might call deleveraging uh, contractions, when uh, the businesses stop wanting to invest at the same time that the people stop wanting uh, to spend because bubbles burst, you know, the history on those is, as uh, Ken Rogoff has pointed out, uh, really very problematic. It is an open question where North America would have been macroeconomically without the Second World War. It is a near certainty that Franklin Roosevelt would have left office in uh, early 1941 at the end of two terms, succeeded by a president from the opposition uh, party, regarded as having not met the economic test of the times, given that unemployment would have been in excess of 14% as it was measured at uh, that time. So that speaks both to the importance of fiscal policy, uh, that was a side consequence of the military buildup, but it also speaks to the fact that it takes substantial time to work one's way through uh, a situation of this kind. And I think if you compare the American policy response to what we were facing, with what the European responses have been over the last uh, couple of uh, years, or what the Japanese response has been over some 20 years um, after their bubble uh, burst. Um, I think the American uh, policy response, even if we can't be satisfied with the results, looks, that looks fairly good in uh, relative uh, comparison. Okay, so if you did a pretty good job, comparatively speaking, the best, if you look at, at these comparisons, why is your president getting beaten up so much? I think, getting, I think uh, you know, I'm, I find it hard enough to uh, predict and analyze economics without predicting and, analy without predicting and analyzing uh, politics. But I think what people in that field will tell you is there's two things. Uh, they'll tell you first, just as a matter of fact, that the president's level of approval or other kind of measures is actually, relative to historical relationships, surprisingly good, given the situation of the economy. So if you just ask the question, we've got an incumbent president, he's uh, served, he's coming up on the end of his third year, the unemployment rate is 9%, uh, growth in the succeeding nine months has been uh, about 2%, or a little less, what's his popularity gonna be? You'd actually predict something significantly lower. I think the answer is that he's popular, his, his problems, his political issues derive very substantially uh, from the uh, weakness of the economy, which in turn derives from what I was just talking about. I think the other part of it is um, 
Look, it is hard to prove a uh, counterfactual. Um, the situation, I believe, could be uh, far, far worse without a number of the steps uh, that the president took. I think it could have been far, far worse if a number of the steps that he was urged to take by some, such as nationalizing the banking system, had been taken. Um, but saying that it is better than it could have been is always a less attractive argument uh, and a less easy argument to be convincing on than uh, saying that it's terrific. And I think that is, that's part of uh, the challenge uh, that he faces. You know, it is much, one of the nice things about being where I am now, um, out, outside of government, uh, writing and thinking and speaking about these things is that it really is much easier to criticize than it is to actually execute. Um, you don't have the responsibility of dealing with the political constraints when uh, you're a critic. You don't have the need to be internally consistent. You can just have a bunch of, you can just raise a bunch of problems with uh, what it is uh, that is being uh, pursued. And so my suspicion would be that, to use a phrase that Joe Biden uh, has uh, used, uh, that elections are not about the almighty, they're about the alternative. And that as the quality of the president's approach comes into relative focus with some of the things that are being suggested, uh, it will come to look more attractive. So journalists also enjoy that privilege of criticizing without having to decide. It's one of the reasons it's so much fun and maybe I, people don't like us. I have noticed. Uh, so uh, you have served and there have been And there have been moments when my enthusiasm for journalists has been more to the abstract rather than for particular journalists. But I've always been very fond of you, Christian. Um, so you've served two presidents, Larry. How are they similar? How are they different? Yeah, I feel very fortunate uh, to have worked with both of them. They are both, each in their own way, uh, remarkable uh, leaders who take what they do extraordinarily seriously, who handle extraordinary complexity and pressure uh, with uh, great grace. But they do have different styles. If you have a meeting to brief Barack Obama on an economic issue at 10 in the morning, you would better be ready at quarter of 10 because the meeting might start early. Uh, and it will surely have started by 10 after 10. If your meeting is a 30 minute meeting, you better get to the point because five minutes before it's scheduled to end, his secretary will walk in with a card telling him about his next meeting and you will be gone five minutes later. If you have written a 20-page memo uh, for the meeting, he will have read every word. If you attempt to summarize the memo, he will be annoyed because he has read every word and he will remind you that he has read every word and encourage you not to summarize what you have said. He will ask a question or two, maybe, to kick the tires to check whether you actually knew what you were talking about. But his fundamental attitude will be that if you're really not good on subordinated debt versus preferred stock, then he needs to get a new economic advisor, not join in the analysis of subordinated debt and uh, preferred stock. He will focus his comments and discussion on how whatever it is you're talking about fits with the broad narrative arc of his presidency, fits with his other broad priorities, fits with the basic story he's trying to tell and the leadership that he is trying to provide. Your meeting will end with some understanding of what he's gonna do after the meeting 
and what you're going to do and what the other what the other people present are going to do after the meeting Bill Clinton it's different the chance that your meeting will have begun before 10 o'clock is zero <laughs> the chance that your meeting will have begun by 10 15 is about even and if it's a three o'clock meeting the chance that it will have begun by 3 15 is about one in ten because the schedule sort of cascades into badness uh, through the day the chance that the meeting will have ended will end on time or about the same as the chance that the meeting will begin on uh, time the odds that he will have read your memo are about even but if you begin to summarize the memo he will turn the pages of the memo like this at about this pace and he will at the end of four minutes have grasped the entirety of your 20 page memo from thumbing the pages and getting the point and half listening to you it is a near certainty that he will have something that he will provide to the conversation I was in the White House Library a couple weeks ago and I happened to be reading the Journal of Finance and do you know that there's a Journal of Finance article that says if you use preferred stock to support banks it's got five advantages <laughs> you know your work you're worried about the unbanked population in Tennessee in 1986 there was a really important experiment have you seen that one Larry <laughs> from while he was not being as disciplined about schedules and reading his briefing papers there was an extraordinary accumulation of knowledge and experience that was always brought to bear he would give me a very good run for my money on anything to do with economic and financial stuff and then I'd sit back and he'd be talking about he'd be talking to the Secretary of State about you know the anthropology of like Kosovo in the 14th century and what it meant for today's conflicts and you know I'd be sitting there and, you know he'd be right in there and you know we do the Secretary of State for a few minutes and you know then we'd be talking about you know what was new in concrete for highway construction with the Secretary of Transportation it was an extraordinary but very different uh, kind of leadership style that I think also got the very best out of people and I think also produced uh, very positive results uh, for uh, the country and uh, you know watching the two of them you know reminded me of some I don't know it reminded in some ways taught me uh, something that I think is not often enough said in discussions of leadership uh, discussions of leadership are a lot like this is you know there's a lot of this is how to be a leader the five steps to be a leader the five things you have to know to be a leader the five approaches whatever it is and there's a lot of truth in all of that but fundamentally successful leaders are always who they are and if Bill Clinton had tried to be a hyper uh, organized hyper scheduled uh, very disciplined uh, leader a great deal of the magic that he brought uh, would have been lost and I think President Obama's extraordinary capacity for calmness and order and sense of purpose even in the most chaotic and uncertain and difficult environment was really a very great strength of his and if he had tried to move off and do something else I don't think it would have worked for him and so in some sense the lesson that I saw uh, watching them was that people who are successful leaders virtually always uh, do it their own way and which one of those do you most resemble or is there a third Summersian way oh I would not be yes, that was good Christian I would not um, I would not begin to uh, compare myself uh, with uh, with either of with either of them you know I think uh, that I have been uh, most successful as a leader in settings where in settings and at moments where uh, 
poking and prodding a problem from every side has been uh, very important. And where bringing energy and dynamism has been at a premium and projecting um, calmness and respect for tradition has uh, been at less has uh, been at less of a premium and those are some settings and not other settings uh, I'm not going to ask where Harvard University and the Treasury fit into being those settings but we Thank can all you. think about that um, uh, so this is my last theme I'm going to ask Larry about so get ready with your questions please um, your column this week, uh, which appears on Reuters, among other platforms, uh, I really liked. Um, and a point you made was that rising income inequality is the single biggest problem in the Western industrialized world today. That's a pretty strong assertion. There are quite a few other problems out there. Why is it such a big problem? I think what I said was that for the long, just in fairness, I think what I said was that for the long run, it was the biggest problem. That in some sense, if we didn't get ourselves out of the Great Recession, nothing else was going to. That was to, your we starting to, point. We had to get. We had to. We had to get. We had to get to. We had to get to that first. Uh, look, I think it's true at a couple levels. If you look at uh, the United States, where I know the data best. Most of the economic growth in the last 25 years has gone to people in the top 1% of the income distribution. If you ask yourself, which would you rather have had really a significant, which would the middle class really have had? Constancy in the income distribution since 1979 or a really quite significant speed up in economic growth, constancy in the income distribution would have done more for them than even a, even a speed up in economic growth distributed in the way that the gains uh, from economic growth have uh, been uh, distributed. You know, the idea about democracy is government by the people and government for the people. And for people to see that as legitimate when good things are happening, when progress is being made, they have to see that inuring to the benefit of most of them. Not all of them, but most of them. People have to believe that whatever's happened to them, their kids have a chance to be at the top. And one of the things that's most difficult about rising inequality is um, this uh, syllogism. We believe in meritocracy. We believe in parents helping their children. And we believe that there's a great deal that wealthy parents can do for their children that other parents can't. You know, we can't say we as progressives can't, or as, we can't say that Head Start, uh, a preschool program for children, can transform a child's life, and not say that there's any, and, and then deny there's anything you can do that will give your kid a leg up if you have no substitute for uh, resources. I mean, this was brought home to me, and it points up the difficulty. It was brought home to me in a very powerful way um, during the time I was president of Harvard. I uh, used to, each year, go watch the admissions committee uh, make its decisions. I would, go, I would go watch for one afternoon and sort of watch while they discussed a number of cases. And they discussed a case. And did they uh, like having you there, Larry? Uh, they were, they, yeah, they were they actually, yes, uh, they, uh, I mean, I don't know, they said they did. Um, <laughs> but what else were they, what else were they going to say? You know, occasionally I projected a little attitude, but um, we had somebody who was actually, somebody at Harvard who was actually terrific. He was just the right kind of person to work with me, because I would say, I'm surprised that we would do X, 
and he'd come back to me with, uh, well, Larry, I heard you were surprised. You remarked that you were surprised that we did X. Actually, we do X for these six reasons, and here are the facts to support it. Would you have us do anything different from X? And usually after I heard his six reasons, I'd go, no, that seems pretty sensible to me. But okay, so here's the case. There's a kid, um, you know, all the Harvard gets huge numbers of really strong applications. Kid comes from a uh, good private school in a major city. Kid's got strong grades, not unbelievable grades, but really strong grades. Kid's got test scores, really good test scores, but not remarkable test scores. So he looks like a kid who would do fine at Harvard, but we've got 7,000 kids to apply like him, and we've got 2,000 slots. But the kid did have one thing that was really quite special, and that was this. The kid spoke Mandarin. The reason the kid spoke Mandarin was that he had done a really terrific and dedicated job working with his Mandarin tutor three days a week after school since he'd been in ninth grade. And he was serious about it, and he had really worked at it, and he was fluent in Mandarin. Not many people are. And he hadn't done it as part of a school program. He'd done it as an activity that he had chosen himself. Well, what's the right way to react to that? One way to react, which I think on balance in that particular case was probably the right one, was this really is a kind of impress really impressive achievement that counts for a lot. On the other hand, what fraction of families in the United States or in Canada would have the wherewithal to get for their child a Mandarin tutor three days a week for four years? How do you think about that? And were we perpetuating privilege? Or were we recognizing merit? How were we to deal with that? I think these are going to be very hard issues um, for our societies um, as uh, we go uh, as we go forward. You know, I think there are some parts of it uh, that are uh, easy. Uh, should the estate tax border on voluntary for many families? Hard to believe that's a good idea if you're worried about uh, equality of opportunity. Should there be so many shelters for the most successful so that Warren Buffett's tax rate is less than his secretary's? Almost certainly, uh, om almost, almost certainly not. Should we be letting public higher education in the United States become unaffordable um, by providing it with less and less funds. Almost certainly we shouldn't be. Um, so there are things you can do that are almost certainly good that address this, but it's gonna be a very profound problem that the way markets are operating, the most fortunate among us are going to benefit uh, to an extraordinary, uh, to an extraordinary degree. And uh, there are more and more mechanisms uh, through which that can get perpetuated. And over time, uh, that raises questions about the legitimacy of the whole system. Is it mostly the way markets are operating? What about the Occupy Wall Street, or indeed even Sarah Palin analysis, that this is mostly about crony capitalism and capture of Ocup it, that it's Occupy Washington. There's, there's room uh, for uh, debate, but I and certainly there are ways in which government is co government is uh, co-opted to serve the interests of uh, those who already have uh, privilege, but I, I think. Uh, the dynamics of technology and globalization probably have more to have more to do with it. When George Eastman made revolutionary discoveries in photography, him and his revolutionary discoveries, just him and his discovery wasn't going to do much for him. He needed to produce a lot of cameras and produce a lot of film. And the result was that for 50 years or so, Rochester had a large number of really high quality jobs and was a thriving, 
great place to live, at least if you didn't like, didn't mind the weather. And hey, you're in Canada. <laughs> yeah, I understand. I knew I was in Canada. And um, that's what happened. And, it, and it, so, and but he, in order to act, use his innovation, had to employ large numbers of people on very generous uh, terms and support a community and all of that. When Steve Jobs had a uh, terrific set of ideas, it made millions of people's lives be better. It was tremendous for Apple's shareholders, who, by the way, could be from anywhere, um, not just from the United States. And the job creation um, globally was much less, and the job creation within the United States was much less, because once he had the design, it was not a big deal to actually carry out the, uh, carry out the production. Well, that kind of change in the way the system in the way the system works is uh, going to operate to uh, concentrate uh, the level of rewards. Okay, let's throw it open. People ready with questions? If not, I have a lot more, but it seems unfair. Yeah, please, sir. Mr. Secretary, uh, Europe is a in trouble, but I'm, what's really scares the heck out of me is the U.S. national debt and the ongoing level of deficit, and and that's compounded by the problems you have with your dysfunctional system, uh, politics, uh, where the Republicans and the Democrats cannot come to agree on anything. Uh, do you see any resolution to this issue in the near future? Okay, that's two questions, deficit and political dysfunction in your country, compared to the excellence of Canada, of course. <laughs> I'll leave aside the, Can I'll leave aside the uh, Canadian aspect. Um, <laughs> look, it's hard to be hardened by the super committee uh, non-outcome. It's hard to feel good about it. It's hard to be proud of it. It's hard to think that it advanced things in uh, an important way. I would say this to you, though, in thinking about current American deficits. The one way of thinking about what the economic crisis was, I said this, I said this in a slightly different way a little earlier, is that businesses all of a sudden wanted not to invest and consumers all of a sudden wanted to save and pay down debt. So if you look at what might be called the private sector surplus, the private sector swung by about 13% of GDP. That is more private savings, less private investment. The natural concomitant of that is economic shrinkage. The reason we're running a budget deficit is that we're compensating for that big swing in the private flow of funds. Because the private sector is borrowing less, the government is borrowing more. That's why interest rates are now lower than they were when deficits started. That's why interest rates in the United States are 30 or 40 basis points lower than they were when uh, the, uh, when the, S&P downgraded the United States. That's why yesterday, when it was announced that the super committee was going to fall, was going to fail, interest rates fell by five basis points. So, if you ask me, in the sh in the very short run, the main problem for the United States is getting the economy growing. That actually probably means, if anything, carrying on the payroll tax cuts making sure that we don't do what would basically be a mistake, which is to start curtailing uh, infrastructure investment. The problem is for the longer term, and there's no question that we're on a potentially unsustainable path for the longer term, and when the economy recovers, there's going to be a collision between rising private demand uh, for funds and still large public demand for funds and at that point interest rates will spike. 
it would be better to preempt that by legislating deficit reduction early. It would clearly be better, be the responsible uh, thing uh, to do. And it's now clear that it's not going to happen uh, before the 2012 uh, election. But I don't think that if it does happen after the 2012 election, or it does happen when uh, there starts to be more of a sign of recovery, I don't think a great deal will be lost uh, relative to it having been announced uh, right now. Obviously, the reason for concern is that when you see the system unable to solve a problem now, and you see a system unable to solve a problem a few months ago, you come to worry about whether the system will ever be able uh, to uh, solve uh, the problem. But uh, I tend to side with Churchill, who famously said that uh, the United States does the right thing, but only after exhausting all the other alternatives. <laughs> Um, Professor Summers, the global economy has changed, the composition of it has changed over the last 50 years, and yet the U.S. dollar accounts for about 60% of reserves. Do you think that in the light of what's going to happen in the coming years, with the dominance of China, that the Brinkman B should become a reserve currency? You know, I have been writing, thinking, and speaking, and at least a little bit of a voice in uh, the public debate on economic policy for about 25 years now, since the mid-1980s. And I have never gone through a five-year period when there wasn't significant concern expressed about whether the dollar would lose its role as a reserve currency. For a while we were worried about whether it would be to the yen, then we were worried for a while about whether it would be to the Deutschmark or a multipolar system, then we were worried for a while about whether it would be to uh, the euro, since the European economic area is so large, and now there's uh, the concern about uh, the renminbi. Who knows what will happen uh, 50 years from now. But it's worth keeping some things in mind for the near term. One thing that's worth keeping in mind is that whenever anything bad happens in the world, the dollar goes up. That suggests that it's a kind of ultimate place you go when you're nervous. Second thing is that the Chinese have a whole set of mechanisms that are directed at making it hard to buy Remdivy and blocking access to Remdivy. And once you've got Remdivy, raising questions about whether you're going to be able to get back out of Remdivy. So the essence of a reserve currency is a stable liquid store of value. And it's into which you can move in, in and out easily. And it's the essence of Chinese policy at this point to make that not be so with respect to uh, the Remdivy. Third, um, I don't think that one should view China entirely with serenity in terms of its economic growth path. Things may work out very well, and they certainly have worked out very well. But as the prospectuses have it, uh, past performance is no guarantee of future performance. And that's true of countries as well. And it's interesting that you and many others ask that question after, um, after the first month in the last five years, four years, when China experienced net outflows of uh, its uh, currency. So I don't think people are going to be, you know, and for the first time in 10 years, you're seeing discussions of devaluation of the remnabi. So it seems an odd moment for the remnabi to come into focus as the place you want to use as a store of value. 
And the last thing I would say is, and, and this is an important, if you only remember one of the things I've said, remember this one, because it's not in the popular discussion as much as it should be. China's going to be the largest economy sometime, probably in the next 20 years. But China has four and a half, to four and a half times the population of the United States. That means it will get to be an, east, an economy equal in size to the United States the day that its living standards become 22% of American living standards. Well, yes, it's a big economy, but at least the world's experience with reserve, uh, re reserve currencies is not that they are typically the currencies of countries that are so far inside the world's technological frontier on, uh, on average. And it would be a historically quite unusual thing for the reserve currency to be a currency that's so substantially lagged uh, of a country whose economy at a per capita technology basic living standards level lagged so substantially. Now in fairness, it would be quite an unusual thing for such a country to build up the kind of three trillion dollars in reserves uh, that uh, China has uh, China has built up, but I, I I guess I'm sort of with Mark Twain about the reports of the dollar's death being greatly exaggerated. Okay, please, Professor Summers. Um, I'd like to ask a question about. Um, in the light of agency theory and the fact that we are all motivated by self-interest and also with regards to um, regulation theory and the empirical evidence that high risk usually leads to high failure rates, why is it that the Obama administration up until today has rejected um, stricter financial regulations? Well, it's interesting. Um, I guess, I guess you could say that there have been some proposals that the Obama administration hasn't supported. But I guess another way to put it would be that the president drove the process that produced the most comprehensive, lengthy, and extensive regulatory, regulatory change in financial markets in the United States uh, in uh, 50 years that is hotly contested and regarded as wildly punitive uh, by uh, the uh, by the financial uh, industry. So, you know, we could discuss specific ideas that perhaps should be added uh, to uh, the regulatory agenda. I think it's also important to remember that agency theory applies to regulators as well. And uh, that the enthusiasm for um, regulation, which obviously needs to be strengthened in a whole set of respects, needs to be tempered with the awareness that some of the institutions where there were the largest and most egregious surprises in 2008 were actually institutions that were extensively uh, regulated by leading financial uh, regulators. And so I think one has to uh, think very hard about the structure of the regulatory proposals uh, that are made. And what's interesting is, interesting to me, is that the two major proposals, or two of the major proposals that are made uh, for what should be added to U.S. financial regulation are various kinds of uh, divorce between banking and investment banking activities and various kinds of limits on how large financial institutions can be relative to the national economy. Canada, which is regarded actually as a significant success story in terms of weathering this financial crisis, at least so far, has much, many fewer restrictions on diversification by financial institutions and a much more concentrated banking system than the United States. And so if you take the leading two things that people who are critical of U.S. financial regulation want, Canada is in a sense a counterexample since it doesn't have them and uh, they succeed. 
whereas the things that Canada has that are thought to contribute to Canada's success, significant capital requirement, uh, significant capital uh, requirements, uh, limitations on leverage, actually were an important part of the Dodd Frank legislation. Okay, I think we have time for yeah, one more question, please. I have a question uh, building off that from Professor Ferguson's question earlier, which is, if I'm understanding you correctly, one reason why deficits have to be run is a lack of private borrowing. So there's public borrowing going on, and then as the economy gets better, you can pay that back. I just have some trouble with this. I mean, Roy does itself ran a great piece the other day about the Canadian politics in the 1990s and uh, Chrétien and Paul Martin's movements to pay off the debt and the deficit, and they took massive chainsaw-like cuts to our programs to pay that off. The times were good. But during the Clinton administration, you had similar good times throughout the economy, but you didn't see similar cuts. You had a surplus created by increased intra-governmental holdings and borrowings. How can we say that this will happen in the future and that the deficits will go down in the future so we don't have to worry about them now, when in the past that same pattern didn't hold out? In the past, you kept having, having the same increased borrowings, even during the economic good times when the deficit should have been paid down. Isn't that slightly disingenuous? I, I, I don't. I don't think so. But I'm. But I may not have fully understood uh, your thought. Let me first say that I've got enormous admiration uh, for Paul Martin, who is a close friend of mine, and who I believe to served Canada extraordinarily well. And every time I think about the G20 and the fact that we are now discussing economic policy on a truly global basis, rather than just among seven uh, rich countries, um, I think of Paul Martin and I think of the contribution uh, that he made to that. To distinguish, and Paul Martin certainly did also um, really pursue a draconian program that brought Canada into a very different fiscal situation than the one he inherited. He and Prime Minister Credit and deserve great credit for that. Sometimes that's adduced as evidence that uh, others can cut the deficit substantially and have their economies expand or even accelerate while they do that. I don't think that argument stands scrutiny. Uh, Canada had very high interest rates, and those interest rates fell by about 800 basis points over the years of the Martin deficit reductions. You can't hurt yourself jumping out of the basement. U.S. interest rates are below 2%. They're not going to fall very far, no matter what we do uh, to the budget deficit. The central source of replacement demand for Canada uh, when Paul Martin cut the budget deficits was a surge in export demand to the United States caused by an increase in Canadian competitiveness and caused above all by a U.S. boom. Tell me that the rest of the world is going to globally boom and pull U.S. exports along and I'll be much more enthusiastic about near-term uh, deficit uh, reduction. During the Clinton administration, uh, I'm not sure I completely understood uh, your comment. I think we were fortunate. We had a strong economy, and that enabled a fair amount of deficit reduction. But that deficit reduction was real. That deficit reduction would have persisted to this moment if, beginning in 2001, the country hadn't decided to do it all. Huge tax cuts. Two wars. I mean, this is the first war financed by a tax cut. Well, not actually financed by a tax cut. War coincident with a tax cut in the country's history. And the largest entitlement program in 40 years uh, for prescription drugs. So if you ask, where did the deficits go before the boom? It wasn't that there was anything ephemeral or flaky about the Clinton progress. It was that we basically went on a binge and tried to have it all beginning in 2001. And uh, when you go on a binge and try to have it all, and then you really need it, you actually have a problem. And that's what happened. We, we didn't um, 
keep we shot the fiscal cannon before we had the recession and that's part of why it's made it more difficult uh, to uh, respond uh, to uh, this recession so from where we are I think that as long as our total level of borrowing is down not up um, running increased public borrowing for as long as private borrowing is limited I think is prudent and indeed necessary to stimulate the economy but I agree with you that we're going to have to make uh, take painful steps uh, to bring the economy under control and it will be easier if uh, the global economy is growing more rapidly which brings us full circle to where we started this conversation uh, by uh, decrying all the problems in Europe Okay, I think our time has run out. Yeah, they're going to close, shut the mics off. Um, I'm going to ask Larry one final yep. blitz question. Can I do that? Yes. Um, so first of all, I just have to say, Paul Martin, uh, who spoke at a Thompson Reuters conference at the Canadian Embassy last week, totally uh, is on your talking points. He made exactly the points you've made now about the applicability of the Canadian experience to the U.S. one. But he did ask me to pass on one message to you. When you were in Toronto to take part brilliantly in the Monk debates, you invited him to have supper with you or something afterwards. And he said, please let Larry know I live in Montreal, not Toronto. <laughs> it's a very big country. Um, my blitz question is... This is, is the problem Canadians have with Americans. <laughs> uh, my blitz question is, we're in a university. What's the big idea, or maybe the big field of inquiry, that you're the most excited about now? W what's the new, new thing? I think there are three. Um, handling large quantities of data to figure things out and do things better is going to transform virtually every, every field of, it, of human endeavor you would think that baseball would actually be pretty far down on the list. But look at Moneyball, and whether it's selling, whether it's uh, selling uh, automobiles or giving out uh, credit cards or choosing articles um, to put on a newspaper's website, uh, big data is gonna transform everything and people who can handle uh, big data are going to be, uh, the soft, we're going to be the next generation of uh, software engineers. The life sciences are going to make more progress in the next 25 years um, than they've ever made uh, before. The 20th century was the century of physics, quantum theory, relativity, nuclear reactors, nuclear uh, weapons. The 21st century is going to be uh, the century of uh, biology. Uh, dry biology uh, is going to change uh, thing. And the third thing is um, understanding the parts of the world that have traditionally been I'm exaggerating a little bit, boutique items in a university education, a uh, university education. Not much is going to be more important to the future of North America than the kind of relationships we forge with China and a number of other countries. If you think about the number of people who have a deep understanding of Chinese society, to take what's probably only the most prominent uh, example in our countries, it is not what it should be. And this is not something that is reversed. Uh, I visited uh, China uh, three, or four year, three or four years ago, and I walked around, and they would ask questions. I remember this one particularly. Uh, they asked, several people asked me, uh, Jack Murtha lost the run for majority leader in the House of Representatives. That's the position one under the speaker. What's the significance of that for Nancy Pelosi's power and for U.S. policy? Well, you know, I actually 
at the time was knowledgeable about that and I was able to give them a thoughtful uh, answer. I'd be quite surprised if there were 15 people in this room <laughs> who remember that Jack Murtha ran for majority leader uh, in the House of Representatives. And I ask myself, how many Americans were there who could ask a comparable question about political changes two levels down uh, in uh, the Chinese system. I'm choosing an example from politics because that's a bit of what I know, but in everything, um, our ability to understand the whole world in a deep way is going to be crucial to the success, to our success as a society. So things I'd name would be big data, the, which is going to transform everything that social scientists uh, do. Uh, science, and particularly what's happening in uh, the life sciences, and coming to a truly global understanding uh, be the three big ideas I think about. Thank you. So